you are. Who is that insane maniac that you have on on that nice station of yours? He comes on after that that uh, nice man who plays folk music on Saturday, and I can't understand it. Charles and I are old WOR listeners for years ago, and we enjoy young John Gambling's program so much, and bouncy Peter Robert. We just love him. But who is this 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 insane hippie maniac? This uh this person you have on the air at Saturday nights. I just feel that you people don't even know what he's doing on the radio. For a nice station like yours just wouldn't have him on. Signed, an irate ex-listener and a John Gambling fan. Just drifting along with the breeze. Just drifting along with the breeze. I'm just drifting along with the breeze. Yoo-hoo-hoo. Just drifting along with the breeze. Now we'll take care of another request. I'm forever blowing bubbles, pretty bubbles in the air. Ooh, they rise so high and nearly reach the sky. Ooh, then like my dreams, they fade and die. Now, two, 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 three. Oh, uh, excuse me. <laughs> I uh, didn't realize that the, we're officially on now. Oh, uh, before we get on the way here, I'd like to... Uh, a municipal judge, Earl Warren, Jr., did you know that Earl Warren of the Supreme Court has a kid? And he's also, yeah, he's also, he's one of the big fuzz. Municipal Judge Earl Warren, Jr., son of retired U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren, yesterday presided on a bar stool in the Pink Pussycat Tavern in Sacramento. And shapely Suzanne Marie Haynes, 22, danced in the nude except for golden sandals and a silver ring. He moved the court to the beer bar in the case of Miss Haynes and another dancer, both charged with indecent exposure and lewd and obscene conduct. Leonard L. Glacey, the proprietor, is charged with soliciting the girls to perform these lewd acts. The jury of ten men and two women, plus about 50 paying patrons, watched the act and then Judge Warren said the jury, and we quote here, and we'd like to salute the American judicial system, which believes in getting all the evidence in. And we quote, uh, the jury got a better look than we would have had uh, if had just plain oral testimony uh, trying to recreate these things in the courtroom. And we thought that maybe an hour or so spent down here at the uh, pink pussycat would uh, give us a little more uh, evidence. So we'll move back to the uh, courtroom right now. Would you please wait that? <laughs> oh, man, that's the way to be a judge. Hooray for Earl Warren Jr., who digs it all the way. Oh, she was wearing a nothing but a pair of pink sandals and a golden ring, and oh boy, she shook it. Everything went up and down and zingity pow, zingity pow. Everything went ding dong and yipping. Ho ho, hooray, hooray, hooray for the pig pussy cat tavern in Sacramento, California. All right, that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> Somehow I like the idea of uh, Earl Warren Jr. in the pink pussy cat tavern. Uh, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. Oh, uh, you you might know a uh, question now. This is just a philosophical question I'd like to ask you. How do you think they spell cat? If it's a you know, it's a, if it's one of these uh, ring ding, uh, knock down and drag out joints. Do I have to tell you that it was spelled with a K? Do I? <laughs> well, as a one word of advice, friends, in every place I've ever been, anywhere in the world, anywhere, I have been in Naples. I have been in uh, Beirut. I have been in Jakarta. I have been in places that I won't even mention on the air. Just the, the name of them is enough to scare you. In Singapore, for example, there is always a place named... The... Are you ready for it? <laughs> oh, no, no. The Kit Kat Club. Watch out for the Kit Kat Club. That's... And you know what? It popped up in a late movie the other night. Who do you think came out of the Kit Kat Club? George Raft. Coat and a rod. 
All right, that's enough of that, friends. <laughs> just just a word of warning there. Oh, uh, speaking of words of warning, we have a note here that scientists from throughout the world are gathering to discuss the size of man's brain. And uh, they also are discussing in San Diego how much of it is used and uh, how much was actually put to work. Only about one-hundredth of man's brain capacity is ever used, said Dr. Antoine Ramande of Paris. He says, just to think of the uh, tremendous importance of his total brain function. Oh, no, I, I disagree. I disagree with the good doctor that the more man uses his brain, the more dangerous he becomes. You know, this is one of the great uh, beliefs that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, that the non-philosophical always have is, man can only use his brain more. Gee, just think how beautiful the world would be. Well, man was really straining his brain when he came up with the atom bomb, you know. I mean, he, uh, that, uh, that's, a, that's a far, far bigger thing than the buffaloes have come up with. A far, far... Now, oh, speaking of exciting moments here, uh, we uh, would like to... Uh... Oh, by the way, uh, I, did, I, I was thinking about this, whether I should do it or not. Oh, here, we've got an invitation. Uh, I have an invitation... Uh, came in the mail here. It says, I have an invitation to meet Miss Plywood. And, uh, yes, uh, there it is. Big jamboree there. Miss Plywood is appearing. And, you know, that hit me right between the eyes because a lot of chicks I've dated have been Miss Plywood. I mean, <laughs> in one way or another. <laughs> it is bad news. Oh, oh, we would like to salute the obscure over at uh, Rutgers. Rutgers University Campus Center in Newark. Uh, we would like to salute the Rutgers. Would you please, if you will? Uh... Hooray, hooray, hooray. R-U-T-G-E-R-S Rutgers, we will always die for you Rutgers, University of Newark, New Jersey Rutgers, this bamboo Wow, hooray, hooray, hooray right, there you go. The Rutgers still over there? I guess so. Uh, but uh, we do have a, uh, a little report from Rutgers here. Uh, I'm using, of course, the native New Jersey pronunciation, so don't write me that I've mispronounced the word Rutgers. That's the, you, have to, you have to pronounce the word in there. I believe it's only polite. I mean, if you go to Italy, uh, it's only polite to, uh, you know, to, to, to you try to use as much as you can the native language there, even if you don't make it too good. I mean, when you, well, for example, you go to Paris... Uh, you, when, when, when man gives you, you know, uh, the usual... Of course, you don't get much to thank people for in Paris, but say you did, uh, for some reason or other, don't say murky. Uh, it, you don't... It, that, oh, that's a nice try, but uh, you should see the word murky in, in, in French means something else than thank you. You're liable to get a shot in the teeth. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I uh, heard a guy one day, uh, he was trying to say something that came out merdy. And uh, there was a lot of problems. And, oh, yes, we're right in the metro there. So don't say things like murky. Say merci. And uh, Now, that's very, not very good. That's Indiana French. But at least they know you're trying it. So when you say Rutgers, uh, this is not the correct pronunciation. It is Rutgers. Uh, pronounce it the way it is pronounced. Like Farham Road. Uh, make sure that you pronounce it Alexander's. That's very important. Don't say Alexander's. It's Alexander. You must try to show the natives that you respect their native tongue and that uh, even though you are not able to fully realize it, uh, you must at least show them that you respect it. Uh, for example, uh, if you're out on Route 22, one does not go to Sears and Roebuck. One goes to Sears. You go to Sears or two guys. Uh, you do not go to two guys from Harrison. One goes to two guys on Route 22. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, for example, you may stop for a little refreshment now if, you, if you're visiting the native, uh, this, this uh, country right next to us here, in, right next to New York, you know, the, the bordering country. Now, if you drop in, say, for a little refreshment, uh, you do not go up and say, I will have, please, a Dairy Queen. One says, give me a Dairy Queen. Now, that's the correct pronunciation. Uh, or one goes to Carvel's, and uh, you get chocolate chimneys. Now, these, now, we're not, now, I'm simply saying they have their own language. One must respect it. 
and uh, I say that uh, uh, this is all this is all part of tolerance. I'm attempting to to bring, and also I want, I'm attempting to bring a little more sophistication to my friends, a little more uh, a cosmopolitan appreciation of of the better things. Uh, for example, uh, I just recently did a show, F Fairly Dickinson. Now that was exciting, and Rutherford. Now. Uh, it was it would have been very easy for me to say Fairley Dickinson at Rutherford, New Jersey. However, I would have put everybody off in the audience had I done that. Because in this way, it's almost a rebuke. It says that I do not wish to learn the native language. How many times has the ugly American been shouted at all over the world? He arrives at, say, uh, Berlin. He spends two years in the army in Berlin, and all he does is spend uh, every day down at the PX drinking uh, what? Valentines. Uh, does he go out and learn uh, uh, stuff like uh, Mach Schnell? No. Does he learn? To... By the way, I, I heard a terrible joke. You know, knock knock jokes are coming back. All right, now would you please knock knock? You, you give me a knock knock. Put it on the uh, on the on the uh, intercom here. Just knock knock. Give her the intercom there. Uh, turn on the intercom. You know, like this little thing here that you can talk back to the studio. Just press the button there and then knock. knock. All right. No, no, hit. That's it. Keith's doing it right. Okay, Keith. Okay. No, wait a minute. No, no. I got a knock, knock. I got it. Wait, wait. I'll knock, knock. Okay. All set now? All right. Here we go. Who's there? The Gestapo. The Gestapo who? I haven't asked the questions. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> Why now? Let's hear that again. That was a poo. You mean you didn't enjoy it? How'd you like my accent? I will ask the questions here. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, very, very, very bad show here. Very sick. Oh, yes, we're saluting Rutgers here. Oh, let's get that going in there, Keith. We don't want to forget Rutgers. Hooray, hooray! Oh, hooray, 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 hooray for Rutgers University. Hooray, hooray, and oh, no choice in the Garden State. Loves you, loves you. Oh, 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 oh. Zis, boom, ba, we sang Rutgers. Hooray, oh, Rutgers forever. We will march ever onwards. Hold it there, hold it there. Now we got this little, uh, this little paper over in Rutgers, the uh, obscure. You know, every paper, every university now has at least five thousand what they call underground papers, and and, uh, <laughs> and this this one has some genuine uh, humor to it. Most of them don't. You know, most of them are are so self righteous that they lose all their their humor. But this is this is this has got a little humor, and they got a column in here. Have you been following this uh, this? Uh, this woman's uh, strike for freedom thing? Have you been following all that women's stuff? Have you? Oh, you mean you haven't heard about all these chicks that are striking? They want equal, equal uh, this and all that stuff? Well, here is a... Now, this is reality. Here's a great column, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to report it just as it is. Crime and Punishment by Ed Schutzer in the Obscure at Rutgers University. And here's what he says. I want you all... I want both you men to listen. Men, are you tired of women judging you by the size of your muscles rather than by your personality? Two, are you tired of women making more money just walking around modeling bikinis than any man, no matter what he does? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, listen to this. Three, is the girl next to you in class getting better marks because she's making it with the professor? And you got to turn in all the work? Yeah, that's true. Men, do you feel rejected because women... Have better bathrooms than men? They do. And there's the last one, the crusher. Get ready with the salute in there. Men, are you tired of women blaming you because they are pregnant? <laughs> Come on there, let's go. Let's sing it out, gang. Sing it out. Oh, I wish I could shimmy. Like my sister Kate, she shimmies it, shakes it like jelly on a plate. Ba ba boo ba 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 boo ba boo ho. Yeah, look at her go out there, oh sister Kate. Oh, she shakes it, breaks it. Ba 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 boo ba ba boo ba ba boo ba 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 boo ba ba boo ba ba boo ba ba Oh, baby. I 
Okay, all together now, gang. Sing it out. Oh, my sister Kate. She shakes it like it. a bowl of jelly on a Like that old jelly on a plate. Look at her go. All together now, gang. I come all up on the street, haze for a Every boy on our neighbor, in our neighborhood block. Yeah. No chicken shimmy. They're all packing stocks. Oh. I may be late, but I'll get up to dead. But I can shimmy like my sister Kate. Okay, now. let's go, gang. Oh, shimmy, shimmy like my sister, like my sister Kate. Kate. <laughs> that ain't exactly Jeffrey Holder music, is it? <laughs> oh, Jeff is so solemn. I wish I could shake it like my sister Kate. Oh, she shakes it like jelly on a plate. Hey, is it time to make the station break yet? No, not yet. No, for heaven's sakes. Uh, you know what? Uh, uh, speaking of... Uh, this uh, little thing here, it says, uh, man, are you tired of women blaming you? Because they, I, I heard that, you know, I heard I heard a chick on the air the other night, one of these angry ladies, you know, with a mustache, always appearing on Barry Farber's show called Women's Strike for something, you know. And, uh, and they, oh, yeah, you can just hear you've got these leather pants on with a bull whip, you know, and she's bugged, and she's tired of men always making women pregnant, see? And she was talking about this. And I'm listening, it was like out of Alice in Wonderland. And, uh, it's as if women had nothing to do with it. <laughs> you know, as if they're kind of just standing around. And men keep doing this bad stuff. Oh, I wish I could shit me like my sister Kate. Maybe that's her problem. She can't. Hey, he says, if these things are bothering you, men, and you feel that they must be corrected, join the Men's Liberation Front, MLF, has plans to cure these and many other ills that be fit that... Beset this sick society, paid for by the leper president of MLF. It's too bad that the president of the MLF happens to be a leper on top of it. Well, that's the way it goes. <laughs> the MLF, I think I'll join that crowd, you know. Get myself a button. And, uh, you know, get, get, try to get some equal value for men. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, he, he's hit on something kind of real there. Because I'll never forget one night. You know, I, I wonder if women really would want equal treatment under the law and everything as to men. I'll tell you, I can just imagine about five million men I know suing for alimony. <laughs> I'm getting it. <laughs> I mean, if they're actually treated, the, you know, uh, with the actual uh, uh, equity under the law. In fact, uh, can you imagine the, what happens to almost every man I've ever known? Every man I've ever known has run into the law. One term or another. Right, Keith? All right. One night I'm riding over the Willis Avenue Bridge, see. Yeah, and I'm playing it cool, see. And I'm just going along there. And uh, everything's under control. I got the radio going. It cuts about 3 o'clock in the morning, see. And I go cooling along over the bridge. And I'm the only car, see. And so uh, I'm just going along there. And I don't know where this guy came from. It's like uh, all of a sudden he materialized. I don't think, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't think it was a real, uh, a real fuzz car. I don't know. All of a sudden it's there, just like poof, out of the air. And zap, I see the U light back of me. Whoo! Those big old red lights going, see? And I'm going along. I know there's nobody else, see? I pretend like I don't know it, see? I'm just driving along like as if it's somebody else they must be after, see? And all of a sudden, this guy goes, wow! He pulls right up in front of me and is, you know, ooh, nothing's worse than to be driving along. And uh, you hear that, you hear that sound. You know, they go, ooh. They just make one little bleep on the, on the sirens. You know, Shoot. I stop. And this great big guy gets out. And he had more things rattling all over him. You know, that's a, they got straps all over him. So he had these straps and these little things hanging out of him. They were rattling. See, I can hear him rattle as he comes back. And he's got a pair of these real big black glasses. So he walks back. He looks in the car there. And there I am, see. Now, what have I been doing? Well, I've been, uh, 
I've been with some friends and uh, and uh, and, you know, it's very innocent, you know, I'm with some friends. We had a little Chianti and a little Dago Red and that. And I'm sitting around there. And so uh, I'm sitting in the car trying to look cute, see? And uh, he looks in at me and he says, get out. That's all he said. He said get out. I said, what did I do? Get out. Well, it was only one thing to do under those circumstances. And uh, being a pragmatist, I always do what is the best thing to do under the circumstances. I mean, when in Rome, you start wearing togas, right? Okay. When that guy is looking in with them big black glasses and he says, Get out. Well, uh, by George, I reach over, see, and I start fumbling with the door handle. And wouldn't you know it, I had this door handle. kept coming off this car. So you had a four and had a door handle come off. So I reach over and I grab the door handle. See, and of course, I'm a little frantic at this point because, I, you know, I want to please. I'm a person who likes to please, see. So I reach over and I grab the door handle. The door handle comes off. Well, I can't get the door out. And he sticks his head. He says, get out. I said, but the, my door handle won't come. He says, you get out of that car. And with that, I go over to the other side quickly, out the door. And now I am out on the street. And he walks around to the side where I am, and everything's clanking on him. He says, all right, let me see it. I said, what? Don't give me no lip. Let me see it. I said, oh, oh. <laughs> Bye, George. <laughs> he says, you. And then, oh, it's going to hit me. Oh, my God. I have not renewed my driver's license. I knew there was something. So let me see it. I reach into my wallet, see, and I got my driver's license, see, my old one. So I, I'm sort of fumbling around. Just give me it. I'll find it. Takes the wallet, and there it is. He looks at it. He looks down at the driver's license, and he looks at me. Is this you? <laughs> yeah. Don't give me that. This is a Goyle's car. J-E-A-N. Oh, you're driving around. You got some chick's driver's license. Hey, Chuck! With that, the other guy comes out of the pole. Now I got two of them. They got a live one. I don't know what I did. All I know is that now I'm really, you know, ever since I've been a kid, I've been fighting guys about my first name, you know? Oh. And so, ever since I'm a kid, I've been having this thing. And this, this guy, and this cop's got my, my license in his hand. See, he has not yet noticed... It's about nine months lapsed, see? <laughs> All he sees is the name. He says, hey, come here, Chuck. Hey, Chuck. With that, Chuck comes out. And Chuck, I want to tell you, Chuck looked like King Kong. I'm t I don't know where they get a big uniform like that. It was fantastic. This guy, you could see hair sticking out of his neck all over. And it was the first, I'm um, really, he had claws, you know. He comes out, and he comes walking back towards me, this great big guy. weighed about, oh, I'd say a good 800, maybe 900 pounds. He comes walk, you know, and we're walking on, and Willis Avenue Bridge, see. And I could feel the bridge going up and down when he walks. He's walking like that towards me. He's a clump, 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 Chuck. And the other guy's got this license. He's looking at it. He's got this, you know, this this uh, little light they carry. He's looking at it. And he keeps looking at me. And he keeps shining a light. He says, hey, Chuck, get out the book. I says, what book? What book have they got? I wonder if you've ever seen this book, friends. Do you know that the fuzz carries a book that's got the pictures of all the really bad guys in the world in it? Did you know that? The real wanted ones, the real bad ones? He says, get out the book. They start going through this book, looking at the pictures. <laughs> I can say, oh, my God. You know, I'm, my trouble is I look like everybody. You know that, Keith? I look like every. That, that's my trouble. I'm, my mother doesn't remember how I look, you know? I'm one of these guys that look like total everyman. And, you know, I can look like any one of 722 thugs in this guy's book. And I can just see me, you know, big lefty Bandini. They finally spot me, you know. <laughs> the guy that knocked over 42 banks in Oklahoma and has been on the lam, you know. <laughs> Dangerous. This man is armed. You know, I'm standing up against the car, and these two guys are walking around. He says, "Give me the book." So I start looking. And Chuck then, that for the first time, talks. He goes, "What?" That's all he said. Hey. And I said, "Hello." And he takes his light. He looks me right in the eye. So what's your name? I said, Gene. <laughs> Gene Shepard. You like that? You got a name like that slob on the radio. Oh, I got a name like that slob on the radio now. 
Just don't give me that. I listen to that guy, you ain't Gene Shepard. He's tall and skinny, got a beard. What am I gonna do now? Not only am I... I'm obviously driving with somebody else's driver's license, which is nine months overdue, plus the fact I am now impersonating an officer. I'm a, it's like, you know, you get out of the car and a guy says, Who are you? He says, You say Johnny Carson. He hits you on top of the head, right? You don't get smart, see? And, yeah, I, and I realized I got nothing on me to prove I'm me. Nothing, nothing except this old out-of-date driver's license, two $1 bills, I got one $5 bill, and I got a $2 bill. You know what a $2, you know, $2, I always have, I keep this $2 bill with me, see, all the time. Because <laughs> somewhere along the line I learned that they, what, I can't figure out, are they unlucky or lucky? Well, I don't know. Maybe I've been getting the wrong dope for years because somebody told me they was lucky, and I've been carrying one for years, and nothing's ever happened but bad stuff. Maybe I better get rid of this mother. But nevertheless, I'm I'm standing in front. Of, I'm telling you, I'm standing by this car. See, these two guys are walking around me now, and one says, "Hey, this guy says he's like the guy on the radio." Excuse you in the name of the guy on the radio. You know that guy Chuck we listen to once in a while on the radio at night comes on after what's his name uh, Ferber. Uh, this uh, guy that's always, uh, always this southern guy that's always betting on the radio, you know. I said, yeah, that's uh, Barry Farber. Don't tell me how to talk, Mac. Sure. Everything I say, I'm going downhill. I'm, I can feel the quicksand coming up around me, you know, the glop. And I'm standing on the Willis Avenue Bridge, and by now they got me over the front of the hood of the car, and they're starting to pat my pockets. You know, well, you've seen, have you ever seen guys do this? And all by this time, drivers are driving by, see, and I can see them looking. I can see guys, you know, driving by to come home for parties and stuff, and they're saying, hey, they got a guy, look at, they got one of them gunmen, you know, the guy's been hearing about on WNS, probably the guys that robbed that bank in Long Island, look at that guy, look at that guy, boy, does he look like a bad one. And they're driving, here I am over the car, see, they're bad. <laughs> I still don't know what I did, see, I don't know what I did. And so finally it occurred to me to ask them, see, and I'm, I'm getting a little scared. Says, uh, excuse me, what do you want? And they're still looking at all my stuff in my wallet. They're taking out the $1 bill. You know. He says, what do you want? I says, what did I do? You know what you've done. I know what I've done. I mean, don't tell me that my whole past is catching up with me now. I mean, you go up to any guy on the street, friends, any guy. And if he's walking along dreaming, Keith, this would work with you, it would work with any guy I know. It would work with Nixon, anybody. It would work with uh, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. You're walking along the street, see, your mind is off somewhere in left field, and you come up behind a guy real quick and tap him on the shoulder and say, okay, Mac, it's all over. And he gets scared. Oh, my God, they got me. I know it. And then he says, what do I do? He said, you know what you've done. His first impulse would be to say, but I didn't mean it. <laughs> or I didn't know any better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Every guy's got his little collection of, of things that he's done all throughout his life. It doesn't make any difference. I don't care who you are. You have planted your little garden of posies. And they're, they're growing somewhere, see. Well, you, and they're, you, they're way in the back of your mind. So here I am hanging over the front end of this car, see. And this guy's patting my behind, you know. He's looking for my, anything else I got, you know. And if you ever, you, you know, when they, they go up under your arms, you, apparently they got shoulder holsters. He's real bad guy. So he's patting me on the, he's all your hands up. So he's patting out here. He goes down here, pats my knees and all that stuff. And I'm really feeling like a desperado, you know. By now, see, I hope they don't discover, you know, I got holes in my jockey shorts, you know. He's, uh, I'm wearing my old shorts today, you know. He's patting me. <laughs> and with that, all of a sudden, the guy says, hey, Chuck. The big one. He says, hey, Chuck. And Chuck says, what do you want? He says, hey, Chuck. This is a girl's name, you know. This guy's, what did he do? Did he steal this license from from the guy, you know? I think his name is spelled with a J, the guy that's on the radio. I bet he stole this guy's license. I says, no, I am Gene Shepard. I said, do you want me to say something funny? You want me to, you know, be funny or do something like I do on the radio? With that, the second cop says, don't get funny. I could tell a phony I've been on this, I've been in this car now for 30 years. I could tell a phony a mile away and use a phony. I said, well, what do I do now? They know, 
With that, the second one goes back into the squad car, and he's calling headquarters. He gets this thing on, you know, with the radio. I hear him in there saying something, and I'm waiting to see what's going to happen. This is one of the world, you know, one of the world's worst feelings when you begin to feel that you're being enmeshed with the law. I'm telling you, it's a bad feeling, friends. So I'm standing there. The, the cop that's watching me is saying nothing. He's just standing around here. And then I got an inspiration. It hit me. For, after about ten minutes of this panic, it hit me. It, it just hit me like that, see. I said, hey, listen, call W-O-R. Call W-O-R. Call them up, and they'll tell you. Hey, that ain't a bad idea. Up there. All right. He says, you get in your car, we'll follow you. Let's go down to the end of the street down there and get that phone booth, and we'll call W-O-R and see if he's really what you say he is. And so I get in my car. I'm scared. And they're driving right behind me. Have you ever been followed by a car that is following you? Right? He's right on my bumper with the U-light going. That red light going. Oh, boy, it keeps reflecting in the mirror. See, And I could see people driving by and looking. And now, guys, I could see them looking out at apartment houses all around there looking. See, <laughs> they want to see, you know. Oh, boy, they really got some bad. Any minute, there's going to be a shootout, see. So I get down to the end there, the street, where there's this this, uh, this uh, phone booth. I get out, and they stop. I got a dime, so I'm looking at my dime. He said, I'll dial a number, Mac. Give me the dime. They got a seat, see. He says, what's the number? Have your, have your mind, little cells in your mind, ever completely blanked out? I know the number of this damn station like I know my own name. I could not think of the number. It was gone. I said, the number, number, uh, it's, uh, 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 Boy, I could see the look of suspicion come over this guy's face like a tidal wave. You know, he's fingering, he's fingering that billy he's got. You know, any minute now, I'm going to get a couple upside the head. You know, he's waiting. See, he says, "I'll find a number." He says, "Hang in there." I said, "You watch him, Chuck." With that, he dials information. He says, "I want W O R number." Keeps looking out at me, and I'm trying to think number, number. Oh God, I got to think of a number. I got to think of a number. I got to think of that number. I couldn't think of that number for. Hell, I just couldn't think of anything. Uh, I guess your mind just goes completely blank when you're under these things. I just wonder how many guys have confessed to stuff, have, have, have blurted out insanities, have been totally suspicious just because of total fright. That's all, complete. And so I'm standing, and now a couple of kids come walking. They stand there and look, see. And it was at that moment that a fantastic thing happens. There's two or three kids that are drifting down the street. They're coming from a party or something. One guy's got one of these satin jackets, you know, that says 23rd Street AC on the back. And, and the cop is standing over by the squad car. He's waiting for a call. He's listening to the radio. And all the time, you know, I can hear that radio. That's the way it goes all the time. And, and, and people wake up. They hear it, you know. This radio's going, see? And it's silent. And this cop is dialing information, trying to get the WOR number, when all of a sudden, it happened. Now I'm a believer in miracles. These kids are walking down the street, and one of them looks at me and says, Hey! Hey! Hey, Manny! That's Gene Shepard! I turned to this kid, and the two cops turned can you imagine? I don't, to this day, I don't know who these three kids are. Can you imagine the three kids have seen Gene Shepard getting busted? <laughs> and I am really busted. I mean, it's obvious. I'm not, I'm not having a, uh, a friendly little political talk with the cops there. It's obvious that we're not talking about the Mets. Because that cop is not, he's looking out at me with that, that angry look. And the other cop is just looking at me with a cool look. And, uh, and the kid says, hey, Manny, look, that's change. Hey, Shep, how are you? Excelsior, Shep, Excelsior. Oh, wow, Excelsior. I turned to the kid and I says, oh, kid, hi, man. I said, holy smokes, tell these guys who I am. And with that, one of the kids, oh, hey, he said, that's Gene Shepard. Don't you know that's Gene Shepard? And the big cop who was standing over next to the squad car, his big, fat grin comes out. He says, don't tell. He says, are you Gene Shepard? You really are Gene Shepard? 
Yes, you bet. Now I'm beginning to feel ten feet tall. He says, yeah, that's right. He's, you're Gene... Hey, 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 Chuck, come on out of the pool. Chuck, this is Gene Shepard. Oh, Gene, we listen to you every night on the radio. Hey, that time you told about the ice cream war that was so groovy. Uh, and I'll tell you the time that you did the thing about the Army ball game. Oh, that was fantastic. Hey, Chuck, come on. Hey, le- hey, listen, Shep, uh, here's the cop, though. Hey, Shep, can I have an autograph? With that, he gives me his book, you know, with all the tickets and all that stuff. <laughs> I said, why, of course, officer. Uh, what is your name? Oh, uh, they, all the guys call me, uh, all the guys call me Big Freddy. Why, uh, just, just why the Big Freddy Excelsior on it? I says, the Big Freddy Excelsior, Gene Shepard. Oh, boy, wait till my kid sees this. He says, I show up. It's, it's groovy. The next time you get on the radio, listen, would you say hello to the guys in car number 4226SJ7 over at the 928th Precinct? And by the way, say hello to Chuck and Freddy. We'll hear you on the radio. So, Chuck and Freddy, if you're listening tonight, old Shep is digging you, all right? All right. Yeah. Oh, how about that for a little drama? Did you enjoy that drama? That's a true story, man. I'll tell you, it was one of the worst things that ever happened to me. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, man, that was that was nervous, Bill. Oh, listen, I had... Did I ever tell you about the time I got busted by the MPs? Oh, did I tell you about that night? Oh, I, I listen, any, any guy who's ever been a yard bird in the Army, uh, anybody who's ever been in the armed forces, and I'm going to tell you an Army story right now, if you don't mind. Talking about getting busted. Uh, <laughs> uh, you see, when you're in the army, you're always afraid that somebody's sneaking up on you. You just, you just, you just develop this. It's just a natural thing, especially if you're an enlisted man. I mean, a real low enlisted man. Now, of course, when you get to be what they call a, a top three grader, I mean, you've got you're not only you've got the catbird seat, man, you own the catbird. I mean, you know, if you're a tech sergeant or a master sergeant, have you ever been in the army, Keith? Oh well, you <laughs> you missed a good part of life, and uh, and I'll th- one day, all right, I'll just tell you a little little story about getting busted. You know, one of the one of the things that happens in the army, and, and uh, if you're if you're out there, you know, driving around, you see some guy in the in the in the armed forces. Just I don't care whether he's a sailor or a marine or a, or a soldier, walking around out there, he's got one thing in his pocket. Or he's actually at two. He's got the one. He's got his pass uh, to get out of the army post or to to, uh, to walk around. You have to have a pass to show what you're doing here. See, uh, two. He's usually got his ID, uh, which is a card that shows that you're a yard person <laughs> and it tells you know got your number and all that stuff on it. And you got your dog tags. That's all you got to prove who you are. That's it. Now, why do you need these? Well, now you've seen these guys walking around once in a while with the big white hats. Well, you seen those guys? Now, sometimes they wear this big armband. Yeah, that armband says MP. Now, if you're in the Navy, it says SP. Okay? That's shore police or military police is what it stands for. No matter how you slice it, though, friends, it's fuzz. That's what it is. Now, these are not your buddies. (laughs) Not not if you're a PFC and you're about four hours overdue on a pass. You ain't. So, uh, one night... And it's terrible moments. I'll never forget this night. And and anybody who's listening in the Army now will know this feeling, this sinking sensation, terrible sensation. I am in this southern town, which is bad enough right there. That's a that's got a lot of things going against it right from the start because uh, there's a there's a certain <laughs> I mean I don't know it's hard to describe it. Uh, a lot of things I dig about the south. A lot of other things that you know are very questionable. But one night, uh, it's a it's about 10:30 at night. And it's a it's a it's a late it's a it's a hot steamy uh, shifting walking around uh, one of those one of those itchy nights in the middle of summer in deep southern Florida. Now, I have seen this place since I've driven through this town. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you the town. It was the town of Stewart, Florida. If you've ever heard of Stewart, uh, Stewart, Florida, and and I've driven through there and I've even looked at this place since. But uh, at this time, it looked almost exactly the way it looks now, except for one thing. It was not tourist time. It was uh, the middle of July. The temperature, I would say, was in the vicinity of, oh, it uh, was down around, uh, oh, it was a cool night. It was down around 95. 
I'd say. It was one of those cool nights. It was 90, 95 degrees. And me and this other guy, me and Gasser, have gotten a night out. We got the pass, see? Now, we had gotten off work that afternoon at 4 o'clock. We came into town to go to a movie. It's about all the, the only action in town, you know. We, we went to a movie. We went out and we had our dinner, our little dinner we bought this place we to get out of the GI food we you know we're having a very 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 circumspect evening we have not done a darn thing nothing has happened everything is cool and we're we're uh, walking around town just looking at the town at the uh, it's now about 8 30 something like that now our pass is good for I think one o'clock in the morning it's like 8 30 at night so everything is kind of cool and we're walking along and we meet two other guys from our barracks. One of these guys I will never forget as long as I live. His name is Nash. I meet old Nash, and Nash was a tall, skinny guy who had a had kind of a pasty face. And he looked a little bit like, uh, well, pictures you see of Harold Lloyd. He looked studious. He looked very, almost like, uh, well, if you could imagine, a tall, skinny Woody Allen. And very, very serious. He never said anything that wasn't serious. And so we meet Nash, and along with Nash is a guy named Dye. Now, Dye is, is the, he is even more studious than Nash. These are two very studious men. And Dye is, is kind of short, and he's a uh, he's very, very uh, nervous type. And his friend Nash is a tall, skinny, calm, very, very placid, but very, very serious guy. And along comes Gasser and Shepard. And I see the two, and I said, hey, Nash, how are you? Well, I'm fine. He was from Tennessee, so I'm fine. So what are you doing? Well, we are just uh, walking around town, enjoying the sights. And uh, Di and I have decided that we'd kind of like take a little ride into Palm Beach. Uh, you know, the bus leaves for Palm Beach in about ten minutes. Would you guys like to go to Palm Beach with us? We'd like to walk around and look at Palm Beach. Well, that's a short ride. So Gasser looks at me, and I look at Gasser, and uh, Gasser says, it sounds like fun. Now, what do you say? Well, our pass was good for a 50-mile radius from the camp, which was not really a camp, but it was just a little uh, a clearing in the woods back in the Everglades. So that, <laughs> that's really what it was, uh, uh, which was populated almost exclusively by 722 trillion mosquitoes and 94 bull alligators and us. That was it. And so I thought, gee... Palm Beach, that does sound interesting. I have never been to Palm Beach. And we had just arrived on this place, and we'd never been there. So uh, we go down to the bus station, and all four of us buy a ticket to Palm Beach. Now we're being very circumspect. You, you never saw four more upright, honest, reliable, almost, uh, well, almost uh, uh, Sunday school type GIs. You know, the usual GIs, they go out and they get bagged, you know, they're chasing chicks. We are merely going to see, yes, we are merely, that's right, we are merely going over to take a look at Palm Beach. So we get into the bus, and it rattles off into the night. And, uh, you know, it's kind of fun. So we're sitting there, we're talking a little idle chit-chat, like, uh, did you notice the library? They have a very interesting library there in uh, in the Stewart. Uh, did you notice that, Nash? Yes, it is very interesting. They have especially, they have a wonderful archaeology department. I was really surprised at the, at the archaeology library they have in that very small library. Very interesting. And with that, Dye says something like, a, yes, that's true. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> and, and, of course, all around us are these nice people. And we're driving into Palm Beach. Well, we arrive at the bus station in Palm Beach. Little did we realize we were stepping right into the middle of a fantastic, disastrous maelstrom. We get out of the bus. Palm Beach, Florida. Now, you've all heard. Actually, it's West Palm Beach was where we were, really were in. West Palm Beach, Florida. And so we're looking about. It looks beautiful. We've never seen this beautiful town. We've all, all of our lives, we've heard about Palm Beach. See, Shepard is 17. You got it? That's how old he is. Gasser is just about pushing 18. I'd say he was probably 18. I would say uh, Mr. Nash was possibly uh, roughly 20. He was the old man of the crowd. And Di, who thought like an old man, was actually about 19. And so here we are. First night at Palm Beach. And uh, 
we see this beautiful waterway. You know, there's a waterway that runs along West Palm Beach. The Inland Waterway, it's beautiful, see. And it was there, it was in the, the bridges are going across. And so we stopped on a street corner, asked somebody, where is uh, Palm Beach? See, this was West Palm Beach. And the guy says, well, you just go right over that, that bridge there. He says, go over the uh, causeway, and that's Palm Beach. It's right over there. You just walk across over there, and you're on Palm Beach. Why, I do believe I'll do that said Nash, and so we walked across this causeway, and incidentally, we walked into disaster. There were two, <laughs> there were two Coast Guard shore patrol guys <laughs> standing at the base of this bridge. Now we walk across it, and they see the, they see the four of us, and they just look at us real cool like. They had these white helmets on, they, they watch these four GIs, because they don't know, you see, uh, uh, an SP or an MP, at least in those days, the first, you, you were you were always guilty unless proven innocent, and the proof took a hell of a lot of proving, that's all I got to say, so we, <laughs> we walk, we walk across the bridge, now, the first thing that we see on the other side of the bridge is beautiful, these palm trees are just lovely, hanging all over the place, see? and we're gawking, you know, our eyeballs are just bugging, and they've got them lit, you know, just beautiful place. It's just like paradise. And out of this, this terrible hellhole that we had come, all four of us, we're now suddenly in this magnificent... You could smell flowers blooming. The one thing that hits you about Palm Beach at night is you smell these flowers everywhere. It's just tremendous. And we're just sort of gassed. Gasser, who was, you know, he says, this is really great. I said, it's really, wow, you know, it's fantastic. And you see a couple of beautiful girls walk by and the night and everything is soft tropical you know how tropical night is Keith it's, you know it just sends you out of your birds oh, you, boy, and I'm wondering, there's a moon hanging over this thing it's about 19,000 feet across and it's just beautiful and we're walking along this magnificent road that leads right into the causeway the four of us you never saw four more innocent GIs in your life we, we have nice pressed suntans on Everything nice and clean. Our passes are all in order. And we're walking past this this bar. Well, now, it would never occur to me to go to a bar. I'm not a bar type. It would never occur at that time, anyway. It never... <laughs> I mean, at that time, I was just being weaned from Ovaltine. I had just started to drink Coca-Cola straight. You know, up to that time, I diluted it. You know, I used to take Coca-Cola, uh, you know, with a little water on the side. You know, it was pretty strong. So, <laughs> Gasser, you see, Gasser, I, I suspect, that still to this day doesn't drink. You know, he, he's a real Billy Grant. You know. So we're walking on. Uh, with that, Nash says, see, fellas, uh, here's our, the old man of the crowd. See, he's very distinguished. He says, uh, fellas, uh, I, I'd be glad to set... You folks, it's just a kind of a celebration as our first pass who got in here in town. I'd be glad to set you up to uh, a little drink of some kind. Well, you know, I've been here this all of my life. Here, I, I can't say, well, I'm just a kid, you know, and I don't... So, uh, Di says nothing. Gasser says nothing. And I say nothing. And so with that, Nash says, will you just come around and let's, let's go and have a little drink. This guy is the absolute most distinguished GI we've got in the whole company. We walk in, and it's one of these bars that's got the purple lights. Have you seen the kind with the purple and the red lights that kind of move? It's got, got stained glass stuff all over the bottom. Very elegant. It's dark, you see, in this place. Mirrors all over the place, see. And uh, here's this bartender. He's working away there. And uh, we walk in and sit down at the bar. All for the first time I ever was at a bar, actually. And the four of us sat at the bar. I had no idea what to order. And so uh, Nash uh, looks at the bartender. The bartender looks at Nash and says, What do you have, man? He spits. With that, Nash says, uh, Well, I believe I'll have a... Uh, I have a, a double Southern Comfort. Well, I never had Southern Comfort. What the hell is this, see? Well, so the bartender looks up and down the line. With that, Di says, I'll have the same. Gasser says, yeah, uh, me too. And I say, well, <laughs> yeah. And I have my first Southern Comfort. Well, well, Nash takes his Southern Comfort. I never saw anything like it. Nash takes his Southern Comfort, and he just goes, whoosh, just down like that. Just goes, whoosh, just, whoosh, it just goes. So I pick mine up, and I sip it. Oh, it tastes so good. This tastes like it. T I'll tell you what it kind of tastes like. It tastes like a turned-on caro syrup. 
If you can imagine carol syrup that suddenly got awful hip, it tastes so good. You know, I just tasted it. Ooh, I never thought it tasted like you know, it. was so good. Nash then has another one. He goes, and it was just then that it happened. Nash had three Southern Comforts. I'm still drinking my first one, and so was Gasser and Die down. We're sipping. It's very strong. Nash has had three of them, and he changes. All of a sudden, he changes, and two sailors have sit down at the end of the bar with that. Nash gets up, and he says, who are you looking at, smart guy? He gets up, he walks down, he grabs one of these sailors by the back of the neck, and he thrums him down to the floor. He says, who are you looking at, sailor boy? I'm going to kick your guts right out through your ears. And he gives him a kick. Well, all of a sudden, there's a fight going on in the bar. Three more sailors jump out of a booth in the rear, and now we're in the middle of a fantastic fight. Seventeen guys are fighting. I'm looking at Gasser. Gasser's looking at me. With that, all of a sudden, Nash takes the sailor, and he throws him right through the front window of this bar. Crash! Like that. Oh, my God, what's happening? I run out of the door. I'm running down the street. I'm running with Gasser. Gasser says, you and your damn... Palm Beach, look at what you got us into now. I'm running down the street. I can hear the sirens coming from all over. There's sirens coming from thousands of miles around, and I'm running down the beach. Running and running and running. I'll tell you, I, you know, I was in real good condition. I, I was in real good condition. But I want to tell you, I was covering the ground so fast, I could just feel my breath coming up in big, sharp, burning gas from way down on the bottom. You know, <laughs> running, running, and I see these red lights, and I can hear the bar crash in back of us. Nash is cleaning up on 500 guys. He turned into King Kong. I'm running down the street, and all of a sudden, these two SPs are standing in front of the two of us. One guy tackles me around the knees, and the other guy gives a block and throws Gasser down, and the two of us are down and laying there. And that SP just looks down at us. He says, all right, you guys, I'm just going to wait and see what happens in that bar. You just say right where you are. That began one of the most fascinating three days I ever spent. You're listening to a guy who spent three days in a Navy slam. Bring it up. <laughs> Woo, what a night, what a night. Yeah. I've been there, friends. I've been there.